Welcome to FaceTime Fly Fishing. I am your host, Eric Straup. So glad you could join us today. It is February 6th. It was one below zero here this morning. Very little fishing happening, but it's supposed to warm up and we should get some uh, melt off. So we'll see what happens. I've got some video to shoot out on the water, so I'm looking forward to that. Hope you're staying warm wherever you are. If you are in your office right now, try to look busy for the next 40 minutes. We've got a great, great show lined up for you today. I'm really excited about this. In fact, I wish I would have had Dave with me this past fall uh, several times when I was on the water trying to get some video on uh, wet fly techniques. I couldn't catch a fish. So stay tuned for this show today because if you have a question about wet flies, uh, design, leaders, techniques, we're going to get them answered today. We've got a great guy, Dave Allball, great friend of mine. Um, he's been fishing the river probably as long as I have. And I'll tell you, if, if you've got a question about wet flies, this is, this is the time to get them answered. A few things before we get going. Um, I want to remind you the tying school that we have. We have a tying school coming up February 27th, 28th, and 29th uh, at the lodge, at my lodge. This is all inclusive. It's 600 bucks for the weekend. Uh, you show up on Friday afternoon or mid morning Friday. You leave about noon on Sunday. All your meals, all your fly tying materials, everything is included lodging, everything. Come down. We're going to tie nymphs streamers, dry flies, and if the weather's uh, decent, we're going to fish them as well. So what I really want to get out of this class is tying some specific designs, putting them in the water, and showing you why we tie them a certain way. So um, check it out. Uh, if you have any questions on it, email me at epstraup at gmail.com. That's E-P-S-T-R-O-U-P at gmail.com. Be a part of the show today. We've got the uh, question answer toggle on. Type in a question or a comment. You can also text me at 814-505-4568. Um, one other thing real quick before we get going. I don't want to waste too much time here today. Um, the Tyrone, Pennsylvania Fly Fishing Festival. Still in the works. Um, having lots of meetings and everything else. We're very close to having some finalized uh, things done on it where we'll have a date and I'll really be able to announce details to you, but we're getting lots of likes on our Facebook page. So go to the Facebook page. It's Tyrone PA fly fishing festival. Uh, check it out. It is going to be awesome. It's going to be in June, probably maybe the last week of May. And, uh, we're going to have a state fly fishing championship, uh, a fly tying championship, and the festival is going to be really neat with lots of vendors, lots of things to do, speakers, the whole deal. So if you have any questions on that or you want to participate in it, give me a call, 814-505-4568, or email me once again at epstraup at gmail.com. Like I said, I don't want to waste much time. Um, I want to get right into our subject. My good friend, Dave Allball. Come on in here, Dave. <laughs> Dave and I have a history. Um, I am guessing it was probably 2008 or so when you came down to my house in Spruce Creek. Yes. And Dave said, I'm interested in getting into this business and, and guiding. Right. And he wanted to pick my brain a little bit. And I said, that's cool. And we started talking. And, and he said, I fish wet flies. And I said, yeah. What do you fish when they're not eating wet flies? He said, nothing. I fish wet flies. <laughs> <laughs> and to this day, true, true. we have shared many, many clients. Yes. And I've heard nothing but stellar stories about you. And I see you at the shows. If you ever go to Somerset or Lancaster or just about anywhere around Pennsylvania, right. you'll see Dave tying and talking about fishing wet flies. Uh, you, your reputation is way up there well that's that's been my whole go, goal to create uh to create a good reputation in this business uh 
the way that I've always looked at it, reputation is, is everything in this business and being honest and doing a good job for your client is, uh, is absolutely, you know, the number one thing on my list. So it's, uh, it's, it's worked out very well for me. And like I said, Eric, um, I, I talked with him a little bit. He weaned me along on, uh, on, on a few things and, and the rest is, has been history for me. So it's been a good history. Yes. So let's get into some, some uh, nuts and bolts here. Sure. Um, you fish wet flies exclusively. Yes. And a big question I get asked all the time is when you approach the stream, you're going to fish wets. Are you looking to imitate something? Or are you looking to attract something? Or is it a combination of both? Well, it's it's a combination of both. Um, specifically, um, I, tie, I tie wet flies that are specific for certain hatches. I tie them um, for um, attractors. Um, I have some attractor patterns. Um, and especially fishing three wet flies at one time, like the old timers used to do, actually gives you a leg up on on the stream um, not only can you fish three different sizes but you can fish three different colors at the same time so you just upped your chances sixfold right there of catching catching a fish or catching doubles i i under that's what makes it really interesting so um so it, it really has the, the, the hatches have their places and the attractors have their places. Uh, like I said, you can do that mix and match um, and, you know, and, and you can have a really good time. You, uh, you do the majority. I shouldn't say that. I think you do a lot of your guiding on the little Juniata. Um, I do a lot of my, I do a lot of guiding on the little Juniata. In, uh, Spring Creek and State College, and um, I do fish the bald eagle um, in State College, which is uh, below Belfont there that Spring Creek dumps into. Um, I also have a place up in the northern part of the state in Potter County, which I fish the big freestoners up there. Um, you're talking uh, Big Pine Creek, Kettle Creek, First Fork of the Cinema Honing. Um, so those are nice big size freestone streams on where, where you can throw a nice long line, just like those old timers used to do. I, I always said there's nothing greater than seeing a fish way on the other side of the bank and right. you can throw 30, 40 feet of line out there and, you know, and swing those flies right down into that fish. Let, that's a good place to start. Let's talk a little bit about casting a, a brace of wet flies. Any, any tips that you can share with us? Um, Cast, casting three flies at one time is, is not, it's not very difficult. Um, the thing is, is you want to make sure that you have, have a good leader built that will turn over for you successfully, you know, when you're, when you're throwing those flies. Um, the, the other, also, also the other thing is, is the, is the fly line. Um, the, the fly line that I use most often is an intermediate sinking line. Okay. Um, that that takes the flies down into from from being say 20 20 some inches or 20 22 inches um, and you want to keep the flies in that zone and that intermediate sinking line does that now the 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 dry fly uh, a floating line has its purposes and a full sinking line has its purposes in this method too but 90% of the time I'm throwing that, that intermediate sinking line because the water is so, uh, that's what I call under normal flow conditions. Okay. Um, you don't use shot. I, I do not do, I do not use any split shots at all. First of all, just kind of imagine this. If you're throwing mm -hmm. a 25 or 30 foot cast, well, everyone knows that if you have a split shot on there on that back cast, that split shot's going to be right down on the top of the eye of that hook, like right away. Mm -hmm. I, I always said the guy that can create a split shot that doesn't move on monofilament is going to be a gazillionaire. <laughs> uh, so what, what I use is, is I use mini sink tips, which I build out of Cortland LC 13, it's called. Um, and they are a loop to loop connection. I build them in one foot and two foot sections that loops onto your fly line and loops onto your leader. Um, 
And this also gives you a way of changing that, that weight from different conditions um, that, you, that, you're, that you're out there during the day. Um, so, so that weight. That's um, a possible video coming up. Uh, for? For me. Oh, for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so how much of your, how often are you transitioning uh, your, your rig as opposed to your cast? Or is it a combination of both? Um, to, to reach certain depths or? Um, what, well, what, what I always say is, is, of course, everybody wants to fish under the ideal conditions, you know, when right. the water is at, 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 at their best. But you don't always have that. You know, um, you know, it might rain the night before your trip. And guess what? Now you can't present the flies correctly right. either with, with that intermediate sinking line. So now you have to adapt and get those flies down to where the fish are at. And everybody knows that the flies are, or the fish are going to go deep and they're going to push out to the sides. Yep. So, so by using that, that intermediate or using that intermediate sinking line or a full <laughs> sinking line. Right. Okay. I can get my flies down to the depth. Now I can also change my leader length too. So if, if the water is high and I want to use a full sinking line, I will shorten, shorten my leader, maybe down to a five footer because I know the fish are setting almost on the bottom. Right. They're, they're not going to be high up in the current. Right. So I will present the flies that way. But once it goes back to that normal flow, I will be using that intermediate sinking line. And 99% of the time, I will be using a, uh, a nine foot leader built for three flies um, with a 4X tippet on it. Let's talk um, about that. Um, with, without going into the details of your formula, um, the structure of the leader, you throw in droppers, uh, you say 4X? Yes, yes. The, and here's, here's the thing that kind of um, brings up a lot of eyebrows on, on, on the construction of the leader. The, the, uh, like I said, the, the main part or the leader that I use most often is a nine footer. And like I says, it's tipped out at uh, 4X tippet. The droppers, okay, the droppers are 0 .015 material. OK, and if you scale that down, that's about 26 pound test. And I get guys always say, oh, man, you are not going to catch a fish on 26 pound test. But yes, you are. You, you will catch a number of fish yeah, on, on, on that dropper. Now, that's for the dropper material. Mm -hmm. um, I make those droppers um, anywhere from four to six inches. And what I also do is is um, I create dropper loops in the terminal part of that leader, okay? So the um, when, whenever I'm sitting down constructing that leader, I have those dropper loops uh, positioned in a spaced out. Um, they're approximately, I'm gonna say, maybe 18 or 20 inches from the first dropper to the second dropper, okay? And then my tippet will be anywhere from about 24 to about 28 inches total from the from that first dropper down to the point fly mm -hmm. that's the I mean, that's the distance there um and that that leader works that leader works very well it, and it, it turns the flies over you have to remember too is you want those flies to stay out away from the terminal part of the leader so that you don't get that wrap around right. on the terminal part of your leader right guys you know and like i said guys always have those eyebrows up and say, oh my gosh, that's, that is so thick that no fish is going to touch that. And what happens is, is they end up putting something, a smaller diameter on those droppers and they have that problem. And I'll get questions like that. I'll, I'll get a question like that. You know, Dave, you know, my droppers keep getting tangled up. And I asked them, what size material are you using? Well, I'm using um, uh, 4X, 3X, it's it's too it's not stiff enough. So what you want to do is is you want to keep those droppers out away from the terminal part of the leader. And you don't have any trouble getting it down because of the line that you're using. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Very interesting. What's the biggest mistake that you see guys make that are going to the stream? They want to fish some wet flies. They read a book on it. Um, and one of the mistakes I, I see is is 
is the fly lines that they're using, okay? Um, because a lot that has, has been written about, they're not really talking a whole lot about that intermediate sinking line or the full sinking line. Pretty much everything is going off of a fly line. Reason being is that everybody's thinking that it's ideal conditions all the time or else they're fishing in a or else they're fishing over a hatch right or whatever but as everyone knows 99 percent of the time when you go to the stream there isn't a hatch there so you have to put something on to get your flies down in the surface a little bit deeper than staying up in the film but when there is a hatch going on you want to try to keep those flies up a little higher up up towards the top of the surface in that film or you know five inches or six inches right underneath the surface and of course that, of course be versatile if you're not moving fish somewhere oh definitely De be prepared to, to change something that and, and definitely um, right um, I'll, I'll change and, and it's and it's really funny because a lot of times when I come to the come to the little jade of fish which by the way is my home water too and a lot of times when I come down here to fish, it's like I can put three flies on and that'll be the only three flies that I fish all day. But when I bring a client on the stream, I have to change <laughs> flies like left and right. But it only takes it only takes a little while for, for right. things to get going. And, and and the nice thing is is then you can keep those three flies on all day and you don't have to change at all. Right. And you know, and you'll have a great time. So that's pretty much the name of the game. Yeah. It's not to change flies a whole lot. <laughs> yeah. Keep them in the water, not right. in your box. Ex exactly. Got a question here from Bill Nidell. Uh, describe a dropper loop and how to tie it. Boy, you know, uh, you know, Bill, I, I, I wish I would have brought the material to tie that loop. Um, actually, no, I, I didn't, I didn't bring it in my bag, but it's more or less what, um, I'm going to say it's when I, de when I describe a, a, a dropper, I'm describing a blood, a blood knot with a right, long tag. Right. That that's old school. Okay. That's what I consider old school. That's the way they used to do it back You're in the day. Than me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I've come up with something a little bit different and, and it, and it's not created, but it hasn't been created by me. Um, actually, I seen it in a field and stream magazine like years and years ago. And but I know that uh, Charlie Mack did that book about knots and that. And I know that that knot is in that book because I seen it in there. And, and, and I thought that was really great. So but that dropper loop is um, it's it's almost like a glorified, uh, a glorified blood knot, I guess. Okay. Um, but boy, I wish I would have had the material here, I'll here, tell you here what, to tie that. What but, we'll do, we'll tie it. Um, Dave is going to stay after today. We're going to film some flies, which will be on the site real soon. We'll get that knot. Yeah, tied. yeah. Oh, yeah, that would be great. And uh, yeah, you'll definitely be able so to see it real clearly. Bill, it'll be on a video. Uh, I hope to have them up by this weekend. Do you ever use a switch rod or spay rod on larger creeks? That's that's a perfect question, Dan. I was just getting into rods. Uh, so, Dan, I'll, I'll answer your question. Actually, to be honest with you, I have never seen anybody on the J or any of the streams, even the bigger uh, freestone streams up north, use a spay rod. Uh, I, on, on these on the, on the water. I, I guess have, I just haven't been there. I have at, a story right for that, <clears throat> but. It just so happens. It just so happens to be that I'm going to be guiding a guy this year that is bringing uh, a spay rod, a two-handed spay rod. So this is going to be the first time. To, from New that, Jersey? Um, I I think so. Older, I, I think, older fellow. Mm, I guided two gentlemen from New Jersey, older guys uh -huh. that came, and I thought they were kidding me. They said, we're going to bring our spay rods. And we were laughing about it. They booked me at Somerset. Oh, okay. And I showed up for breakfast and they said, well, we brought our 14 foot spay rods. And I laughed. It was June. I mean, the water was low yeah. and they wanted to swing wet. And I went 14 foot spay rods. I said, guys, I can't even help you with this. I don't know how to, you know, ended up, we caught some fish, Yeah. but it took us a morning to get sort of in the, the guys could cast yeah. a mile. Yeah. 
so so this is going to be my first time <laughs> with a spay rod. But um, is Eric, you you wanted to ask about the rods? Um, what do you like? <laughs> the rods that I like, and um, I'm more a traditional type of guy because wet fly fishing is an old uh, method from the 20s, 30s, and 40s of of what we know it here in in the East, um, and. I just switched over to bamboo a couple of years ago, and um, I, I thought, you know, I I want to bring a little bit more tradition into what I'm doing, but and I absolutely love it. And um, I have now I have four bamboo rods, and and no, I'm not going to become a collector of of bamboo rods. At least I don't think uh, that the, the guys always told me they says once that bug bites, it 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 hurts real bad. Well, yeah, after <laughs> about the third one, it, it started to hurt a little bit. But um, I fished graphite for for over 30 years, and um, I fished uh, Orvis rods, I fished sage rods, um, I even. Uh, was hooked up with the guys from uh, Mystic Rods uh, from up in Michigan. Um, I have actually I have uh, a couple of their first rods uh, that were built when they first started. I mean that was their first show, and I met them, and I got I got with them, and I started selling some rods for those guys. Uh, so I do have a couple of of their uh, first edition rods. I call them. Do you like fiberglass at all? I haven't tried fiberglass. I, I know that fiberglass thing is making a really big comeback. Um, comparable mm -hmm. bamboo, I, I, I hear. Um, I never had one in my hand, but I know I got one of those old Fenwicks with the triangular plastic rod tube yep. sitting in my closet at home. And um, actually, mm -hmm. I think it's a six weight. Yep. Um, but personally, myself, um, I enjoy fishing five weight rods. Uh, uh, here on the J and up north. Any uh, length that you like? Um, length is, you know, I guess I'm kind of a creature of habit too. I, I've, I've cut my teeth on eight and a half foot rods, so that's what that's what I've bought over the years. My cane rods, they're all eight and a half, and to get a cane rod eight and a half foot is uh, is kind of out there because mm -hmm. the builders just don't build them that big. Yeah, um, they get heavy. You know, so so these rods were are you know were specially built for me. Um, the other thing too is um, uh, hexagraph rods uh, from Powell. Um, I I have one of those rods, and those rods are all kind of um, I'm going to say slow to medium, slow up at the tip, medium in through the middle, and stiff down at the butt. Mm -hmm. That's that that's preferably what I like. Um, you have to remember those fish hit those flies so hard. It's not like they're coming up and sipping on them. They're coming up and they're slashing on those flies, and 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 they're hitting the fly very hard. So you actually need that slow tip to absorb that shock right. from that. So if you have that slower tip and a little bit of belly in the line coming from the tip to where it hits the water, that will give you two different areas where that will be great. If, if you have both of those, that will up your chances of, of hooking up. So I want to get into flies here a little bit and selection. Um, but before that, how often with what you're doing is the take does it occur once everything is tight do you do much where you're getting the fish right. with the dead drift or is it are you focused more on the dead drift or more on the swing or on the the lift right um how how, how i fish these and how i get my clients to fish these is is we fish downstream okay i like to fish them down and across so i cast at a 45 degree angle downstream as soon as the fly line hits the water i throw you start throwing men's in it and it all depends what type of water that you're fishing sure. if you have a very fast current or if you have have multiple currents you you have to mend a lot so you're actually you're dead drifting those flies for at and, least a short short it, it, exactly so the name of the game is is keep them dead drifting just like if you were fishing a dry fly upstream, you want to keep that drag off of that dry fly. Basically, the same is is happening here too. As soon as that fly hits the water, you want it to get at the dead drift 
so that um, it sinks. Right, and, and, and it'll be sinking, and it'll dead drift, and by mending that line continuously. Now, when it gets straight down, straight down from you, what I like to do is I like to do that lesion ring lift. I like to pick the rod up just a little bit mm -hmm. so that the flies start ascending up into up into that top water column and into the film. And then I pick up, pick the cast up, and throw in again. There's absolutely no false casting involved. It's one step. Pick it up, cast it, get it down, start the mend. Now there are times too when you have to create some movement in the flies, and I call it jigging. What I'll do is it's just like pounding a nail, okay, and it's all coming from your wrist, and this gets the tip action of the rod bouncing, and it also bounces the line like this in the current. Well, you have to remember if you have – 20 feet of line out there or 30 feet of line out there, you have to jig those flies harder to transfer that energy right. out to where the flies are so that you can just get those flies just barely to move just a little bit. And a lot of times that'll trigger. The, and there'll be days when you go out there and the flies hit the water, they don't want them on a dead drift. They want them moving. They want to see some movement. And that happens a lot, which you could really understand why when a hatch is just starting to come on. Right. Uh, take the sulfurs, for instance. Um, you, you know, as soon as that flies start hatching, you know, those fish know that those flies are really vulnerable. And just putting that little bit of movement in, they just about tear the rod out of your hand. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a learning experience out mm -hmm. there. You have to experiment how the fish want the flies presented that day. Either they want them dead drifted, or jigged, or maybe even a combination of both. No two days on the stream are ever the same. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Just when you think you got it all figured yeah. out, you go the yeah. next day, and, and none of that works. Yeah. yeah. Um, fly selection. Let's get into this. Um, I know myself when I fish wets, a lot of times I'm fishing a, a hook size that is much bigger than what I would be fishing if I was trying to imitate uh, a sulfur, for example. If I'm fishing a sulfur wet, I'm probably throwing a size 10 or a 12 hook. What, what's okay. your take on that? Um, I, 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 on just say the sulfur, for instance, I know the, the sulfur is, you know, approximately the size of a 14 or a 16. Um, I will tie them on 14s, okay? And I will, I will try to match the size as closely as possible. Okay. Um, I, I think the size and the color um, – and also, along with the softer materials that I construct that fly out of, there's lots of movement in that. And I think that movement is really the key. So I think that size and movement is, is pretty much the key to, you know, on the, to that fly. Mm -hmm. I've got another question. Please discuss the length of the cast. So you are, you're talking 30, 40 foot cast yeah, in uh, a lot uh, of cases. Right. The, um, the, the cast... Of, of course, when I step into the water on the river, of course, I stop and I kind of look. So what I will do is, is I like to fish close first, okay, because I don't want to be walking out there and stepping on top of the fish. But all the fish laying, are right? on the other side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when all the fish are on the other side, I'm waiting in the position <laughs> to, you know, to present the flies to them on a swing. Um, it, and, and like I said, I will start in close first and stay back. And, you know, I will drop them flies maybe two, 20, 24 inches above the fish and leave them swing in. Now, what's really excellent is, is if I see those fish raising, um, what, what I'll do is, is I always try to stay above them. If I'm in a position where a fish is coming up directly across from me, I won't cast to it. Mm -hmm. I will reel in. I will move back upstream so that I can get the angle on it so that I can dead drift those flies right into them. into them. But what another cool thing is too, is, is if you can pinpoint and remember where that fish came up, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll throw the flies, drop it about two foot above the fish, and just where it rose, what I'll do is I'll jig the flies and put just a little bit of that movement in, and the hit is so fast and hard that, you know, you'll be just be going, wow. So you don't put a thingamabobber on the end? No, of no, no, <laughs> no thingamabobber. So, yeah, um, and, and the other thing about the flies too is is um, 
if you see me at any other shows, I, I have all my boxes there. You can come and look at my flies. I do not, I do not have a single bead in there and nothing against beads, but I kind of like to just stay on that traditional side. Uh, you know, we have the a, wet fly. Thing. <laughs> we have a standing joke. Dave is very particular about his work area. Everything will be lined up absolutely perfect. And anytime at the shows that I walk past his desk, I will turn one of his fly boxes or, yeah. and I know it just, yeah, I've, 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 I've had some of the other guys, um, some of the other guides and uh, attendees at the show, they'll come over and they'll take the flies out of my box. And like Eric said, my boxes are laid out that there's in a row it's and, disgusting. and I have two patterns per row. So, it's so there's five, so there's five of each fly in, in that row. So what these guys will do is, is they'll come and they'll bring a bead head and they'll take one of my flies out. And just by the way that I have my lights positioned, that bead head just like glows <laughs> in the box. And so they know I'm anti bead. <laughs> So we got a good question there. So you can you dead drift on a downstream presentation? And I think what you were describing, Dave, is is exactly a dead drift on a downstream. Yes. You're putting it in there and mending. Exactly. Keep, keeping the pressure off of those flies to dead drift and sink them. And then once everything tightens up, boom, they start. That's where they you get start, your lice and ring right, lift. They start, they start to lift. come up a little bit right. and, and swing slightly, and, and then you recast. Yes. Yes. And and that um, – that, and like I said, it, it all depends what type of water you're on. Like I said, if you're in a, um, I'm going to say, like a pocket water type where you have different currents in that, of course, your casts are going to be just, you, you want you want to put your flies in, in those pockets, like behind the rocks or through that, through that glide between two rocks or whatever. You want to present those flies in there and you know, and like I said, either a dead drift or that jigging technique would, like I said, how, however the fish want those flies presented that day. So when you look at a piece of water, I would, I know myself, when I think about wet flies, I think of it in arcs. And I think that you think of it more in straight lines of where you can feed your right, flies in. Right, right, and, and, really and, interesting. right. And, and I'm looking for, basically what I'm doing too is, is, you know, it would be nice if you had that ideal stretch of water that you would, and I call it medium flow. Okay. Now picture this, I call, and this is what I call medium flow water where the water is moving and it's just kind of rolling along. Okay. With no white showing. So right. like no white caps on it. Uh, that the is the yellow house right above the truck. Yeah. The first yeah that's, that's, that, that, yeah. that's an excellent. And there's a lot of excellent spots on the J here right. that have exactly perfectly that. perfect wet fly water. So I am looking for that. No white caps on, on that moving water. That is the absolute perfect kind of water to wet fly fish. So if you're feet. thinking of the water in lanes like that, do I have that right? Um, well, I think of it more. I, I think of it more on current. I'm, I'm looking at the current more. Um, but, but like I said, whenever I get into a piece of of pocket water where there's some boulders or whatever, I try to get those flies into every every nook and cranny that I can come up, you know, that I can come across because I know those fish are tucked up right in behind that boulder. And you know, if you get it right off to the side of the boulder, you know that those fish are swimming out and they're grabbing the fly and they're going back mm -hmm. because they're not going to stay out in that real fast stuff. So I'll drop, I'll drop the flies in the back of the boulder to see if, if they might want them there because a lot of times they'll sit back just a little ways. Right. And all you need is that, what, 12 or 18 inch right. to get a good drift right there in 12 or 18 inches. So if you can get them presented correctly just in that distance okay that's Te another, technical that's question right. for you on a seam say you have a soft seam against right. a current how do you fish that soft seam with another fast current being in, yeah. the, in the way yeah well basically what what i try to do is is i'll i'll try to get my rod i'll hold my rod up a little bit now this is where those switch rods might come in a little bit so you're high sticking handier, a little right? Bit. Actually, you're you're okay. you're, you're kind of high sticking a little a little bit. Um, also, I know there in the last couple of years, a lot of the rod manufacturers um, 
are building uh, 10 and 11 foot rods um, for, I, I know a lot of the competition nymphers are using these yep. very long rods. These rods here, from what I hear, and I've, I've seen uh, a couple of guys use them, a couple of guys have been on trips with me, use them. Those are those rods are really good for for that uh, right. different types of current that the, uh, that you're dealing with. Um, as far as myself with my bamboo, of course, like you said, bamboo's a little bit heavy, and I'm not a real big guy, so my my arm might be a little bit tired during the day. But like I said, I want to get through that water and go find the good water right. of, of that of that real good moderate flow what, uh, uh, that I like. At what distance do you feel you're at your um, optimum uh, effectiveness? As, as far as the cast? Yeah, I would say like um, anything within 15 feet, you probably feel like you're at a little disadvantage. Um, well, well, of, of course, the, the longer cast that you make, probably uh, the, the – it's it's going to be a little bit harder to control the line because now you're going to have to pick up the rod and create that big loop right. to get that mend in in the fly line. So that's going to cause you problems right there because obviously you're fishing in an intermediate. That line is already a couple inches underneath right. the surface, so it's going to cause you a problem of picking that line up. But if you have that longer that switch rod or one of those 11 or 12 foot uh, I, I call them competition rods. I, I'm sure that's not the right term for it, but I know that's what a lot of the guys are using. Um, that that is going to really really help you out a lot. For me, it's going to be a little bit a, a, a little bit of, of hindrance for me. But still, I like making that long cast, and just from doing this so long, I can mend effectively at that long distance. Because for me, there's nothing greater and giving me the, the top pleasure of seeing that fish out there, you know, 30, 40 feet, and I can bomb that fly out to him and catch him way out there mm -hmm. because the hit is so, you know, you have that much line out, and that's just not commonly heard of. Right. Uh, because, you know, when you're when you're nymphing, you're up close. You and don't need a 40-foot right, leader. Right, you don't need a 40-foot leader. <laughs> Anybody that watched the show last week, I'm still getting emails about that. Um, and we're going to revisit it, by the way, because it's so interesting. In fact, I've got another guest planned coming up in a few shows. Uh, we're going to talk about Spanish nipping in particular. But um, good question here. To get a longer drift, why would you not cast upstream, retrieve slack, then feed line as it passes you? It's personally myself. I... I don't like to fish it upstream because I feel like that I'm fishing a nymph, okay? Yeah, uh, moving upstream and casting those flies upstream. Now, if you talk to the guys that are from the UK, what we're how we're fishing them down and across is absolutely wrong. That that is not the proper well, way. You, you are aware, Dave, that in Pennsylvania we fish upstream. Yeah, I, I know that, and I've been told that a number <laughs> of times. I'm, I'm I'm always the guy that's fishing the wrong way, but um that on on occasionally i i will cast these upstream but 99 percent of the time i like presenting them down because my reason is thinking is is the hit is a lot more harder on that downstream presentation than it is on the up now when you when you're casting it up it's just a little bit little bit more subtle take i mean i'm not going to say it's a soft take, but you have a little more slack in the line. I correct. Mean, when I throw a wet fly upstream like that, if, I might quarter it up. It's to achieve depth. Right. Um, I'm never. I don't throw an intermediate line uh, just because I don't have. Right. It's not what I normally do. So, for me to get those flies down, I've got to quarter it up a little bit and then manage right. the line. Right. Um, so I think that would be an example, Dan, of where you'd want to do that. I think. Uh, with your rigging, it's it makes more sense to fish it the way you fish it. Yeah, because uh, you're already getting depth. Right, right, and, and and like I said, that that line, that that intermediate sinking line, is is what's getting you the, the depth. As soon as it hit, as soon as it touches down on the water, yeah. it's starting to sink. And like I said, that line sinks an inch to an inch and a half a second. So, uh, you know, by the time it 
it makes its full swing and it's straight down, but almost before it gets straight, I'm, I'm going to, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it's going to be down at the max, but once it gets down straight, it's going to start to come up a little bit on you. We had a, we had a question. How long do you keep it in that position? The, the straight down position? Yeah. Um, not very long. Um, and like I said, whenever, right, right, it is, right as it gets to the end, just for maybe about four or five seconds. And then what I'll do is, is I won't pick it up in a hurry and cast again. What I'll do is, is I'll just lift the rod so slowly up. Like, and once I get to this point, what I can do is I can make my cast effectively right from here. Now the flies are up really high. Then you can pick up and then put the flies back down on the water. Thank you. This was a great show. Stay in touch with me. If you have any questions, what's your contact info, Dave? Um, my website is www.wetflywg at gmail.com. Um, that's my email. Uh, you can also go on my uh, website, um, and that's uh, wetflywaterguides.com, uh, and send in your questions. Yeah. Uh, I'll answer all your questions. And if you happen to be at any of the shows, by all means, stop over and talk. Um, I'm always always willing to talk and, and to share and to pass this little bit older tradition along uh, like, like I said a lot of guys aren't out a lot of guys aren't doing it out there um, I know with the soft tackle craze coming on um, you know it's been on for a while now it's uh, the circle is somewhat starting to get a little bit closer to being closed and I'm right in the circle there and um, if there's any way I can help you out good man call me good man um, we've had some fun over the years so give Dave a call Go try this type of fishing. It will really help you um, make your game as versatile as possible. Definitely. Uh, this is a way when they're not eating anything else, you can catch them this way. Right. Um, when it's technical, there's a lot of times we'll sit here and we'll change flies a hundred times trying to catch them with a dry fly. Uh, somebody like Dave can go out there and make one cast with something that's not even related sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And and catch them. And uh, it's a great way to imitate a lot of the hatches that we have here in Central PA. Right. So wealth of knowledge right here. Thanks so much, Dave, for coming and being a part of the show. Thank you for having me. For FaceTime members, we're going to tie some flies right now, and they will be on the site this weekend. So I'm excited. Thank you. Stay tuned next week. I think we're going to stick with a Friday schedule. Um, if you have any issues with that, send me an email, let me know. But the Fridays have been working out really well. Uh, I think we got all of our questions in. If we didn't, we will uh, we will get, get you back in an email. So stay in touch. Hope you get out and do a little fishing. It's supposed to warm up here in a few days. And uh, until next week, good fishing.